Welcome back to The Real News Network. I'm Paul Jay. This is Reality Asserts Itself. We're continuing our series of interviews with Eddie Conway, who was a Black Panther in Baltimore, was convicted in 1970 of murdering a policeman, a crime he says, and most people that have looked at the case say he was not guilty of. Uh, he was released about six months ago after serving 44 years. I suggest you watch the other parts of the series because we're continuing a, a multi-part series of discussions. And now joining us in the studio is Eddie Conway. Thanks for joining us. Okay, thank you. So uh, we left off in the last part where you're talking about the, uh, the trial. Uh, you didn't participate in the defense. Um, and now you're waiting the, uh, uh, the jury's deliberations. And uh, what are you expecting? Actually, I'm expecting that they wouldn't find me guilty because I did not see how 12 people could see the evidence and hear what the, uh, the story was and still come back with a, a, a guilty verdict. Now, it was a majority black jury. I believe it was, and it's not clear in my mind, but uh, uh, the newspaper reports say it was. Uh, I tried to check some a uh, couple of years ago to make a determination. I talked to other people. Nobody's really clear, but apparently it was a majority black jury. Now, just, just for the, people that didn't follow the whole the whole story here, you yeah. you didn't participate, so you're actually down below in a holding cell. Yes. So it's not like you're looking at the jury every day. In fact, if yeah. I understand correctly, you were relying on television news at night to find out what happened during your trial during the day. Yes, that's correct. Yeah. So. So the, the moment comes, and you're not expecting to be convicted, and you hear guilty. What, what is that moment for you? Well, obviously, it's a, you know, it's a, a big letdown. One, you know, uh, I, I had to face the fact that I had been deceiving myself. I, I, I thought that, on the one hand, my politics said that uh, you couldn't get a fair trial in America and all the things leading up to it indicated that I wasn't going to get a fair trial in America. But at the same time, I kind of felt like, well, 12 rational people, you know, a group of my peers, should be able to look at this stuff and see that there is nothing there and make a rational decision. That didn't happen, so I was disappointed and at the same time kind of disappointed in myself for believing that there was a possibility of justice in spite of what the government was doing. Uh, and, uh, you know, that hits you hard. I now, mean, this, okay. as soon as you're convicted, mm -hmm. it's an automatic life sentence. Yes. And you actually got life plus 30 years. So what is that? If you already got life without parole, what is the 30 years? Now, did you, but you had, no, there was the possibility of parole, right? You just yeah. kept getting turned down. Yeah. But, but yeah. what's the extra 30 years for? The extra 30 years was for the assault on the other police officers, both um, the one that got shot and the one that claimed he got shot at. Yeah. It Again, was 15 years apiece for each one of those. Right. Yeah. And it's the same issue as the murder. Yeah, you're not there issue. for any of this. Yeah. Um, so, uh, so you're, you're being held in a, in a cell, mm -hmm. and, and your, your prison time more or less is beginning. Uh, and it doesn't take very long before you're in the middle of the, the, the you-know-what hits the fan. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there, um, apparently when I got into the prison itself, there was a hundred guys waiting in the prison that wanted to be Black Panthers and that had kind of like watched the trial and watched the ordeal of me going through city jail and so on. and. Uh, Initially, when I got there, my uh, position was that I didn't have any time to be working in the population with anybody. Uh, I didn't have any time to be considering doing any organizing or prison reform or anything like that. I needed to figure out how to get myself out of prison, and I needed to spend all my time and energy focusing on that. Uh, but. Uh, the guys were so insistent, and it was so many of them, and some of them seemed so sincere that it was almost like it, impossible not to come and help them and not to come and kind of like provide some leadership for them and uh, uh, some education. And so at the, 
the sacrifice of my time and energy in terms of getting myself out, I went and I worked with them. Now, but almost from the first few days, there's an incident that involves you into in a, in a prison uprising of sorts. Yes, and it also caused me to start smoking. I had never smoked in my life. Uh, but apparently they had taken over uh, a building, had captured some hostages, and uh, I, I was unaware of what was going on, and eventually they sent for me and asked me to negotiate uh, the release of the hostages and a settlement of their grievances. And so I end up in the middle of uh, um, a hostage situation, and, um, and I did negotiate it, and it did get resolved, but uh, I end up smoking five or ten cigarettes in the process. So uh, talk a little bit about who, as you get to know the people in jail, Mm -hmm. I mean, you knew, I guess you knew a lot of people in what, I mean, some people call street gangs, and you call street organizations. Mm -hmm. uh, you had contact with people in street organizations prior to going to prison, or did you start to get to know more well, in the prisons? Well, they weren't. There was, there was in street organizations and street gangs at that time. There were like neighborhood crews. There, uh, there was very little kind of drug trafficking in 70, 71, 72. I mean, that was something that, that kind of like came, grew out of Vietnam. Uh, and uh, the organization, the street organizations we see now didn't exist then. In fact, in the state of Maryland, uh, the, the prison administration actually created and allowed those kind of gangs to grow to counteract the uh, organizing we were doing in the prison system to uh, bring about reform. Uh, and uh, they allowed a young, uh, new family it was, in fact, they allowed a, a, a young mob of maybe three or four hundred young people to organize as a gang to try to convince the population not to follow us and not to uh, uh, push reforms. And of course, the population being somewhat older, in most cases, uh, from, from grandfathers to fathers to uncles, et cetera, to adult males, uh, just pretty much pushed for the reform. But the administration could only rely on the young people to kind of help them out, you know. And so for a long time, they were actually working for the administration. Some of their leaders were actually being paid off by the administration. And this is now pretty common stuff throughout jails throughout North America to have now, gangs. Gangs are actually the yeah. the disciplinarians in the, in the yeah. prison. Now it's the tool for uh, uh, prison management, and prison management uses the gangs to keep control of each other. They divide and they conquer, they create conflicts, they, they format violence, and they, uh, they uh, also uh, uh, allow the population to be drugged. Well, I was just going to ask you, uh, yeah. when, you're first, when you're first in, how much drugs are there and, and, and how does that develop over time? There was very little drugs when I first went in. Um, 70, 71. 70, 71. Uh, there was a minimum amount of drugs. People were taking pharmaceuticals, uh, pills that they were getting from the dispensary or or other kind of things. Or they were, there was some smuggling in of a little marijuana or uh, stuff like that. Very, very little hard drugs. Yeah. And uh, when, when do you start to see the kind of drug proliferation that we see now, which is, uh, if I understand it correctly, it's not very hard to get drugs in prisons these days. Yeah, and, and actually it occurred somewhere within the next three or four years to 73, 74, 75. By the time I, because um, uh, uh, I spent a tremendous amount of time on, on lockup or in solitary confinement, as they call it, right? By the time I got out of, uh, off a of lockup, you were in lockup for how long? I spent the first six, the first seven years, I spent six years of that time in, on lockup. And what Sometime were the, what were the conditions of lockup? Uh, well, the conditions were you were locked in the cell, you didn't have anything, you didn't, 
You, I mean, you were allowed the soap, toothpaste, that kind of stuff. You weren't allowed anything else. You stayed in that cell for 23 and a half hours. You came out for a half an hour one day and got a walk. The next day you came out, you got a shower, uh, and it rotated from shower to walk. Uh, but you did pretty much, unless you went to the hospital or you had a visit, you pretty much you were locked in that cell. 23 and a half hours a day hours. for seven yeah. years. Yeah, six, now why, why, six of the seven years. Why, why are you in there and not general population? I'm in there pretty much because I refused to be abused. I mean, that's really the bottom line. Or when I got into the prison system, they were treating uh, the prisons like animals, and uh, it was acceptable to some people, and it just wasn't acceptable to me. So I resisted it, I rebelled. In some cases, I actually got into physical conflicts with the guards, uh, and I end up uh, getting uh, time on lockup. Uh, and probably the last, uh, well not the last, but next to the last, the time that I got the longest amount of time for uh, was an incident that uh, that occurred down on the flats where they beat a person for a block in front of hundreds of people. And it led to almost a riot, but it led to a cell throwing of police officers. And I actually got locked up because I was the leader of the group that actually had the attack. They tried the attack. to save this person that was being beat, yeah. beaten up so badly. Yeah. And you write yeah. in your book, if I, if I remember correctly, mm -hmm. that they essentially tried to kill you while you, they had you. Yes, they tried several times to, to kill me. They tried to kill me at that particular time. They tried, they actually had a hit man that tried to kill me. And um, then they actually just- Hit man meaning someone from the prison population was yeah, paid. Yeah, some, yeah, a guy, and they, he, was, he was from the psychological ward, in fact, and they had, uh, well, first, first tell us the story yeah. of what happened when th this guy's being beaten in front of everyone, I guess, to mm -hmm. show, yeah. send a message. Yeah, well, and, and it was normal. It was, that was normal policy in the prison at the time. And uh, the, the tears were very long, and so the distance from one end of a, a cell block to the other, you could look, it was the same way as looking up a block. In fact, they were a block long. Uh, and uh, if, if there's an incident happened down at the other end and the goon squad, this is the guys that were uh, trained to beat and suppress anybody that was rebelling or getting out of hand or causing disruption, they would come and get a guy and they would beat him and they would start beating him and they would beat him and drag him and kick him and he's screaming and hollering. And the rest of the prisoners are watching, and so pretty much guys are in their cells. The cells are no, they're everyone's out, out milling around. They're out, they're milling around, and they just open a carter up in front of where they're going at, and they bring him up like it's like through a gauntlet. They they come through the gauntlet. How many guards them. are involved in the beat? Sometimes it's six. I mean, most of the time it's the crew is like six. You know. Um, so what did you do? And, well, I didn't do anything. I was actually up on the tier at the time, and one of my guys... Looking down on this. Yeah. One of my guys apparently stepped out and confronted him and told him to let the guy go. And they threatened him and told him that they would come back and get him. You know, and they said, we'll be back to get you. And so they, they left. They took this other guy away. And when they came back to get him, there were several other guys there with him waiting for him. And they, they got to fighting and then they got to actually, there was stabbing involved and one of the police got stabbed. And uh, eventually they subdued everybody. What's um, your role in all this? My role is that they came back later on and locked me up. They locked up the leaders of the organization. And of course, I was up on the tier, so they locked me up. So you weren't even involved directly in the fighting? Well, I did get attacked. I wasn't involved in that fight, but I was off, off like one tier away um, when uh, an officer, in fact, uh, I did, I got time for that. Uh, an officer attempted to hit me with a billy club, 
well, because it was, it wasn't a riot, but it was chaos, and it was like fighting going on down there, and it was fighting over in a couple other places, and it was fighting down on a, in, in another area, and uh, the officer basically, they knew that it was my organization, and he attempted to hit me with Billy Club, and I took it from him, and I ended up getting an assault charge for that, and I ended up getting a robbery charge for taking his billy club. <laughs> you uh, had a robbery which I, charge yeah, for taking I, I, I couldn't, You're getting beaten with a billy yeah, club? And, 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 and that, I mean, that kind of like boggled my mind. Because we already got life plus 30 years, do, so. You know, yeah, yeah. So, But the, uh, the consequences of this is, is solitary. Yeah, so they, uh, but actually what they did was they attacked me and they tried to kill me and they hid me uh, in the, uh, the death uh, chamber where they uh, had the, uh, uh, the gas chamber is uh, where they were executing people. But at that time, uh, it, was, it wasn't in use because it was a Supreme Court ruling or something that declared that it was illegal. I should just quickly say, uh, Eddie told me this off camera, when he was sentenced, the jury at the time, while they found him guilty, he was not guilty with a death sentence. It was life... Uh, uh, plus the thirty years. Mm -hmm. So you're so the, what, and what happens yeah. there? What, what so happens? So they they uh, well they actually broke my jaw. They broke my shoulder. They you know they uh, you know uh, uh, beat me unconscious. They uh, they they hid me up in the uh, the uh, gas chamber area and where where no one ever goes. And it was a, a vacant part of the prison. And they kept me up there for two or three days, uh, and they wouldn't tell anybody where I was, and the, my lawyers, et cetera. Were the injuries such that you thought you were dying? Well, the injuries were such that I would have died if uh, the lawyers had not gotten uh, a court order for them to allow them to come into the prison system and see me and they brought a doctor in with them, and they, at that point there, then uh, was ordered by the judge to take me to the hospital. Well, at the time, I had several broken bones, and uh, I had I, obviously an infection, in, in uh, a serious infection from just being uh, left there. You know, and the intention, and the intention was to leave me there until I died, but I, I didn't die. Now, yeah. You're convicted. Uh, mm -hmm. You had this kind of dual thing going on in your head. Politically, you kind of knew you would never have justice. On the other hand, mm -hmm. you personally kind of felt this jury wouldn't convict. Mm -hmm. when, you, when, when you are convicted and you hear those words, life, mm -hmm. is there still some thought, well, on appeal, we'll overturn this? I, I, what I'm asking is, when does the moment actually really sink in? that I'm actually here and maybe for the rest of my life? Well, I never thought I would be there for the rest of my life. I mean, it, so that moment never sunk in. I, for some reason or another, I mean, my resistance to believing that this could stand was like very strong and I always thought that it could be straightened out, it could be corrected, we could do the uh, investigation, we could unravel this thing, uh, there could be justice somewhere down the line. Uh, and so we, we raised money, we organized, we campaigned, we uh, did all kinds of investigations, we you know, got the best attorneys we could, and it was always that something is gonna change about this because it's wrong. Um, and, um, and several times it looked like it would change, and several times it was very close to changing, and then uh, misfortunes caused it not to change. Uh, uh, initially, probably the Supreme Court thing should have actually have gotten us relief, but it didn't. Uh, Which, few, what Supreme Court thing? The Supreme Court case with the faulty ID, because that's the same police. The photographs, right. Yeah, that claimed that he had seen me grew up, right? Um, but that didn't happen, and then a few years later, they actually made a decision that all of us had received an illegal trial. Uh, that was probably about 12 years after I was locked up. 
Uh, why, why was it probably an illegal trial? It was an illegal trial because the Maryland Constitution was in conflict with the United States Constitution about allowing uh, the jury to decide what the law was. In other words, if I understand correctly, the judge told the jury you do not have to follow the guideline yeah. of yeah. guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so you were in for 12 years, and, mm -hmm. and that's found to have been unconstitutional. Yeah. So how the heck are you in for another 30 years and change? Well, even though they acknowledged that it was unconstitutional and they changed the Maryland Constitution because of it, they still made us fight for the next 30 some, 32 years in fact, they made us fight for the next 32 years uh, on every level, on peel after peel, they made some deals with people, they, uh, they gave people, some people that looked like they was getting ready to actually win a victory for us, they gave them relief because each, even though this was a class of people that was affected by it, the, the conditions was that each person have to fight along. So more than 30 years yeah. after the conviction is found to be unconstitutional. Yeah. Yeah. It's not till like six months ago you actually get out. Yes. And even there, you kind of had to make a, a choice uh, of fight this thing and probably stay mm -hmm. in for the rest of your life. Yeah. Or agree to get out with time served so you don't actually get to reverse the original conviction. Yes, that's true. That's true. You have to, you basically, you had to forfeit whatever rights that you might have had to challenge the state for whatever things that they had done wrong in the past to you. You could either sign that or you could stay and fight for another two, three, four, who knows how long. You know, there's people there right now, uh, a couple hundred perhaps, that's still there and who knows how long it's going to take. Still there, to convicted unconstitutionally. Yeah. yeah. All right. In the next segment of the interview, I'm going to talk with Eddie about how the heck is he not furious? Because when you talk to Eddie, you do not talk to an angry, bitter person. At least it doesn't seem so. I, um, so join us for the next segment of our interview with Eddie Conway on Reality Asserts Itself on The Real News.